EW10 goes on location for the National Evangelization Conference. Today, Dr. Ralph Martin takes an in-depth look at mercy and mission. As I start, I'd just like to uh, maybe update you a little bit about what I've been involved in over the last number of years. Some of you I haven't seen for a number of years. And I just want to tell you that Sacred Heart Seminary is really an amazing place in terms of evangelization. About 12 years ago, Cardinal Maida decided that we needed to make a real culture change in the seminary. And so he came up with a new motto for us called preparing heralds for the new evangelization. So that's like the focus of the seminary right now. And then he decided that he wanted to give an advanced pontifical degree uh, focused on the new evangelization. And he got permission from the Congregation for Catholic Education and Seminaries uh, to offer a pontifical license in, in uh, evangelization, which is a, the only one I think exists right now. And then about three years ago, they gave us permission to offer it online and summer sessions, which is the only pontifical degree that they've allowed that to happen with. And so we now have about 37 priests who will be arriving in several, in about two months to spend five weeks at Sacred Heart Seminary from all over the country, all over the world really. And uh, a lot of bishops now don't have priests that they can let go, you know, for sending them off for Rome or sending them off to, to Detroit for a couple of years. And so doing an online course each semester and then coming for four or five week summer sessions is really hitting a real chord with people. And we're just really excited for the opportunity to be forming priests in the new evangelization that are gonna go back to their dioceses and serve in that kind of leadership kind of way. Uh, but also throughout the seminary curriculum, uh, we're sending the seminarians out onto the streets, we're sending them out to do alpha things, we're sending them out to do uh, Christ Renews His Parish, we're, we're actually giving them lots of evangelization, evangelization experience, uh, which, which we think will really pay off. And then the whole Archdiocese of Detroit is going through a cultural change. Uh, Archbishop Vigneron has dedicated himself to changing the culture of the archdiocese into a culture of evangelization, and there's just all kinds of things going on. So we're, we're living in a blessed place where a lot of things are really being done on a very serious institutional formation level for changing the culture of the archdiocese and the culture of the seminary. The other part of my work is with Renewal Ministries, and uh, we are working all over the world uh, just got a report from our team in China. Uh, just got a report on my cell phone from a team that's in Africa right now. Uh, and we're just doing all kinds of things to try to strengthen and train uh, lay leaders and priests and bishops in, in the new evangelization. Two new things that just recently happened in the last couple of years is we felt like there was an unserved group in the church, those in their 20s and 30s, uh, and that not a lot is really happening for them on the diocesan and parish level. So we've, we've started a new ministry called ID 916. That, that's what those kind of folks like to do. They like kind of things like that. And it's called Intentional Disciples, and 916 is 1 Corinthians 916, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel. So we have about 15 chapters now in different parishes around the country, and we have a, a, a monthly kind of internet video that we do live from Ann Arbor, and then we have a small, growth, growth, a small group growth resources and you know mentoring and all that kind of stuff. So we have a really, really exciting thing happening for people in their 20s and 30s. And if you're interested, you can just go to our website and click on the ID 916 kind of uh, menu. And the other thing we've been doing is, you know, evangelization is happening. I mean, millions and millions of people are encountering Christ and have been for many, many years uh, through the Curcio movement, through the charismatic renewal movement, through various parish renewal programs, now through Alpha, now through uh, Christ Life. And I mean, evangelization is happening. You know, it, it isn't a mystery. It isn't just a theory for people to encounter Christ, but millions and millions and millions of people are encountering Christ. So what we try to do is put together in a seven week video series with, with resources, it's called As By A New Pentecost. And this is stuff I've learned, we've learned from the Curcio movement, from the charismatic renewal, but we thought that these principles could be applied anywhere to anybody without necessarily being needed to be connected with a movement or to join a movement. And so we sold about 3,000 of these that are being used in parishes and you know all over the place. 
where people are really being led to an encounter with Christ and experience more of the Holy Spirit in their life. And so that's a resource that's available on our website too. So if you go to renewalministries.net, click on the store, you'll find As by a New Pentecost, a seven week video series that can be used in parishes and homes or, or wherever. Now, I've been involved in every kind of evangelization you can imagine over the years. I, I've done street evangelism, I've done high school evangelism, I've done college evangelization, I've done just stuff all over the world. But I'm not gonna talk about any of that. I'm gonna talk about what I think is the most significant issue that underlies motivation for evangelization. I'm gonna start by reading you something that Archbishop Vigano, the papal nuncio to the United States, drew to the attention of all the American bishops just a few years ago. And these are words you're probably somewhat familiar with that John Paul II, two years before he was elected pope, spoke when he was here in the United States. So Archbishop Vigano is addressing all the American bishops, and he's saying this. He says, at this point, I would like to call your attention to the words that then Cardinal Wartila delivered during the Eucharistic Congress in 1976, because it seems to be so profoundly prophetic. Now, honestly, papal nuncios aren't supposed to be profoundly prophetic. They're supposed to be profoundly diplomatic. And they're supposed to say stuff that you have to kind of read the tea leaves to really kind of get the message. So, as we know, Archbishop Vigano has been kind of stepping out in, in, in really significant ways, and this is one way. So now he's quoting the soon-to-be Pope John Paul II, who says, We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think that the wide circle of the American society or the wider circle of the Christian community realize this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ and the anti-Christ. But this confrontation lies within the plans of divine providence. It's therefore in God's plan, but it's a trial which we must take up and face courageously. And then he mentions that he thinks Cardinal Wattila was inspired by St. Faustina uh, with this prophetic sense. And as some of you know, Jesus told St. Faustina that he was sending her to prepare the world for the second coming. So there is that definitely in the divine mercy devotion and it has that eschatological kind of note to it. Now, I don't know whether this is the final confrontation or not, but I do know that when I read these words, I wanted to find out what scripture actually says about the final confrontation. I later found out that Cardinal Wartila when he gave his retreat to Paul VI that was published on the, under the title A Sign of Contradiction, actually took this scripture passage as a way of trying to understand what he was sensing. And it's 2 Thessalonians chapter two. So Paul begins, 2 Thessalonians chapter two says, let no one deceive you in any way. And it's amazing how many warnings there are against deception from the mouth of Jesus and from the mouth of the apostles. Confusion, doctrinal confusion is not abnormal. It's right there from the beginning. And it's here today. But it's very, very important that we not be deceived and that our people not be deceived. And I'll, I'll tell you why as we go on in the talk tonight. So he says, let no one deceive you in any way because despite the rumors that you're hearing that the Lord has already returned, he won't return until two things happen. The first thing Paul identifies as the great apostasy. Now, as you know, apostasy isn't something that pagans do, it's something that Christians do. And what it is, it's a turning away from faith on the part of those who once had it. You, you've heard some statistics here today which are pretty sobering. I mean, going from 100 parishes to 30, but it's really happening in the Catholic heartland of the United States, in the, in the middle Atlantic states, in the New England states, in the Midwest, the upper Midwest. There's just a, a radical and accelerating decline. 
In one archdiocese, I just was looking at the statistics, just in the last 15 years, there's been an almost a 50% decline, and it was already declining, you know, way before that, but a 50% decline in baptisms and Catholic marriages and all kinds of things. And, and, and across the country, closing of parishes, closing of schools, uh, just kind of a, 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 a tremendous decline. And what's happening, it reminds me of something that Cardinal Wuerl said at the Synod in, uh, on new evangelization. He said two things that really struck me. He said, we're being engulfed by a tsunami of secularism. The world is being engulfed by a tsunami of secularism. The global village is now in the hands of enemies of Christ, I, I, I must say that. And that people are being lured and seduced and deceived and manipulated and bullies. You know, the anti-bullying people have turned out to be the big, biggest bullies of all. And, and there's just tremendous pressure on people to blush for the gospel, as Paul VI said in his document, Evangelium and Theonia, to be ashamed of the gospel. There's, there's a tremendous pressure to not speak about certain things because we know our culture doesn't want us to speak about those things. But like the reading in, in, in the letter of James that we just read, you know, he who is a friend of the world can find himself ending up an enemy of God. So what we're dealing with is a tremendous spiritual battle right now for the souls of our people. You know, the devil really is roaring like a lion seeking to devour souls, and he's gonna use deception. So the first thing that Paul says is that the Lord's not gonna return until there's a great apostasy. I don't know whether what we're seeing now is the final apostasy or not, but it certainly is a very significant apostasy. 1,700 years of Christian culture are being aggressively and ruthlessly rejected and stripped from our way of life. Catholic France, Catholic Italy, Christian Germany, Christian England. And in our own country, we're experiencing a chill we're experiencing things coming from our culture and from our government and from our higher institutions of learning, which are really lower institutions of learning, quite honestly. The wisdom that comes from above isn't being taught there. The wisdom that comes from below is being taught there. That's devilish. That, that's really what we're facing, and we need to really look at what we're seeing with the eyes of, of revelation. The only, the only accurate vision of what's happening in the world is with the eyes of the Lord, and he reveals that to us in his word. So we're seeing something like a great apostasy, whether it's the final apostasy or not. Quite honestly, the only way we'll know that is if the Lord comes again. <laughs> really, everything else is speculation, but take note. You know, Jesus says when you see these things, you know, perk up, wake up. The second thing that Paul says needs to happen before the Lord returns again is a removal of a restrainer that the Lord has placed on evil and lawlessness. And he says at a certain point, this restrainer is going to be removed and we're gonna see unrestrained lawlessness and wickedness culminating in the appearance of the Antichrist. Now the last sentence or so that I'm going to read is the thing that's really relevant for us and our ministry. The coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with pretended signs and wonders. That's why we need authentic signs and wonders. We need the full power of Pentecost. And with every wicked deception for those on their way to perishing. So one of the, one of the tools that Satan uses to lead people to perish, which means to hell, is deception. And then it goes on to say, who's going to be deceived? Who is on their way to perishing? It says it's those who refuse to open their hearts to the truth in order to be saved. Another translation, it says, those who didn't love the truth and open their hearts to the truth in order to be saved. Now the last sentence is, a lot, is kind of shocking. It says, therefore, 
God sends upon them because they've closed their hearts to the truth, because they refuse the mercy of salvation, God sends upon them a strong delusion to make them believe what is false so that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in immorality. Now we probably all had enough scripture scholarship in our, in our background to know that God isn't doing this to people but he's permitting it. That when you close your hearts to the light the darkness grows and you become vulnerable to greater and greater darkness and you bring upon yourself the condemnation that Jesus speaks about frequently. John's Gospel, those who believe already have eternal life, those who don't believe are condemned. That's what Jesus says. Now, don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> Honestly, one time I was, I was talking about this and a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, my Jesus would never say that. Now that's a little scary, isn't it? The other thing that Cardinal Wuerl said at the Synod that really struck me, he says that the number one priority for us as a church today is to recover our confidence in the truth of our faith. It's not just an optional enrichment exercise to enrich people's lives. It's really about rescuing people from destruction, saving people from perishing. One of the deceptions of the evil one has been to insinuate doubt and skepticism about the reliability of God's revelation. Scripture, tradition, the teaching of the church. And that's exactly what we see happening with our first parents, right? Remember what, how Satan worked? Did God really say that? Does he really have your best interests at heart? Maybe he's trying to keep you from a fulfillment that he's jealous of you having. You can see that implied. Challenging the goodness of God, challenging the reliability and clarity of his word. Did God really say that you will not die? Well, you know, maybe, I don't know. I think we heard him right, you know? I, th I think that's what he said, you know? And then Satan directly contradicts God's word. No, you won't die, you'll be like gods. That's tickling the flesh. It's the same tactic, it's the same invitation, it's the same deception that's being utilized a million times a day all over the world. And of course, that was a lie, wasn't it? Because they did die. And that's why we die. Death is a punishment for sin, it is. The reason why human beings die is because we rebelled against God and we share in that rebellion and we add to it our personal sin. It wasn't God's intention to bring death into the world, it was through the envy of the devil that death came into the world, scripture says, it was through the envy of the devil that, scripture, that death came into the world. So, I'm gonna talk about what I think is a major, well, I wanna to finish on the scripture thing. People's confidence in the word of God has been shaken. What does Vatican II teach about how we're to approach the word of God? Constitution on Sacred Revelation, section 11. It says everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and to teach first faithfully, firmly, and without error those truths which God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. The words of Jesus and the words of the apostles are there for the sake of our salvation. Now, admittedly, there are some things in Scripture hard to understand. But like Mark Twain said, it isn't those things in scripture that are hard to understand that most disturb me, it's those parts of scripture that are so easy to understand that most disturb me. <laughs> there are so many clear assertions from the mouth of Jesus and the apostles that we have enough to keep us busy for several lifetimes. But we need to recover our confidence in the authority, <clears throat> the truthfulness, 
the importance of the assertions of Jesus and the apostles. And these assertions are coming into more and more conflict with the lowly wisdom that comes from below that's pervading our culture. So we're in for a spiritual conflict. We're in for spiritual conflict. They, they would like to silence us, they really would. There's a profound rebellion that's going on, rejecting God's plan for the human race, rejecting the purpose of the creation, rejecting the image of God in male and female, saying we can create ourselves. There's no more profound rebellion than that. And that's, that's the pressure that we're beginning to feel, and that's the, the spiritual battle that we need to be aware of is really taking the souls of our people. Lots of church-going people who still come to Mass are coming with not the mind of Christ and the Spirit of God, but the mind of the world and the spirit of the age. Thomas Aquinas says, the clear authoritative preaching and teaching of the Word of God can actually deliver people from satanic deception. You don't necessarily have to pray with people for deliverance, although sometimes that's exactly what's needed, but clearly and authoritatively speaking the, the Word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit can set people free from deception. One place in scripture it says, Satan builds strongholds in our minds. So there's a battle going on in teaching and preaching. There's a battle going on in evangelizing. Okay, now I'd like to talk for a little while about mercy, the title of my talk, Mercy and Mission. There's just a lot of talk about mercy today, isn't there? We're now in the extraordinary jubilee year of mercy. Uh, Pope Francis has made a major theme as pontificate mercy. St. John Paul II published a whole encyclical on mercy. Uh, the Divine Mercy Devotion is one of the most powerful, popular devotions in the church today. It, it's, it's hard to go into a church these days and not find some sign of Divine Mercy Devotion, you know, whether it's in the bulletin or, or, or whether it's in the image or, or whatever. So there's just a tremendous way in which the Holy Spirit is drawing our attention to the mercy of God. But there's also a lot of confusion about mercy. There's a lot of vagueness about it. And an awful lot of people have drifted into a mindset that goes something like this. God is so merciful, he'll never let anybody be lost. Have you heard that? Have you run into that? It's called presumption, and it's a sin. And it's a deception. One of the most significant deceptions right now that undermines zeal for holiness and zeal for evangelization is the presumption, the deception, the lie that's been infiltrated into the culture that God is so merciful that he'll never let anybody be lost. God is so merciful that he's dying so that nobody may be lost, but he never imposes his mercy and there always has to be a yes to mercy. So let's talk about how to understand what mercy is and how to understand the response to mercy that's necessary for it to be effective in a person's life. And I think that confusion about this has put Catholic people into a stupor of indifference about evangelization. You could, they can hear all the exhortations to evangelizations that you can imagine, but in their back of their mind they're saying, why bother, does it really make any difference? I'm not really attracted to that anyway, and everybody's gonna make it anyway, basically. Maybe not Hitler, but who knows, he maybe had a bad childhood, and who knows. The main scripture passage that John Paul II and Pope Francis use when they're introducing their teaching on mercy is from Ephesians chapter two, verses one to 10, which is a tremendously vivid description of the gospel. There's a lot of talk about the gospel, gospel values, things like that, but there's a lot of vagueness about what the gospel is and what gospel values are. This really puts us right in the center of it. It starts out, you were dead because of your sins and offenses as you gave your loyalty to the present age and to the prince of the air, that spirit who is even now at work among the rebellious. All of us were once of their company. We lived at the level of the flesh, following every whim and fancy. And here's the shocking phrase, 
and so by nature deserved God's wrath like the rest. Whoa. The default situation of the human race by nature is deserving God's wrath like the rest. What's God's wrath? The way Father Francis Martin, the scripture scholar says, he says what it is is that the intense love of God experienced as anger by those who have closed their hearts to his love. This is the bad news, by the way. The default situation of the human race, apart from Christ, is lost. As somebody once said, unless you understand the bad news, when you hear the good news, it seems like no news. Oh yeah, sure, God loves me, I know that. Yeah, you drink me, Mary, you know, we're all going to heaven, God loves me, yeah. But like St. Catherine of Siena said, the cross of Christ isn't a joke. There's a huge problem we're facing. It's the problem of sin. It's the problem of death. It's the problem of satanic bondage. And the only thing that can break that in a person's life is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And the power of the Holy Spirit. And the sacraments of the church. Here's the good news. By nature, we deserve God's wrath like the rest. Here it comes. But God is rich in mercy. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. We deserve hell, we're getting heaven. Wow, what a deal. Let's get in on the deal while it's still time. You know, let's tell other people about the deal while it's still time. Let's people know that there's a gift for them. You remember how all those Portuguese and Spanish explorers were looking for the fountain of youth, you know? Right now, Google's looking for it. They think maybe by 2020, we'll be able to live forever. You know, we'll see. A lot of them are looking in Florida, but I guess people are still going down to Florida looking for it. But they, they come back in coffins. They do. The only antidote for death is to be joined to the resurrection body of Jesus. The only antidote for death is to be joined to the resurrection body of Jesus. That's where eternal life is. That's where what we call the fountain of youth is. It's coming from the living water that flows from the side of Jesus. That's where it is. And the fear of death is almost like the root fear of humanity. That's why we get all the stuff. That's why we don't feel like we have enough. We don't have enough money, we don't have enough love, we don't have enough things, we don't have enough. And scripture says that Jesus came to destroy the fear of death that the devil kept us in bondage through. We'll never evangelize unless we swallow death, as Teresa of Avila says. She says, unless we swallow death, we'll never do anything. She was talking about her nuns being over-concerned about their health. It's, it's kind of humorous. She says, one day they stay away from community prayer because they had a headache. Another day they stay away because they just had a headache. And they stay away three more days because who knows, they might have another headache. She says, oh, God, save me from this complaining among nuns. <laughs> Perfect love cast out fear. God is rich in mercy. Because of his great love for us, he brought us to life with Christ when we were dead in sin. By this grace you were saved. Sounds a little Protestant, doesn't it? Listen, it gets, it, gets even, it gets even more Protestant. Listen to this. It is owing to his grace that salvation is yours through faith. This is not your own doing. It is God's gift. Neither is it a reward for anything you have accomplished, so let no one pride himself on it. And then the last sentence here, we are truly his handiwork created in Christ Jesus to lead the life of good deeds which God prepared for us in advance. Faith without works is dead. We're saved by grace through faith. And the response to this mercy is a life of holiness, a life of service, a life of love, a life of obedience. Faith without works is dead. But there's a reason why 
the first moment of salvation is nothing that we can earn, nothing that we can deserve, and nothing that we can buy. You know, the line in one of the Psalms says, what price can a man pay for his own life? We can't. There's no way of purchasing eternal life. There's no way of purchasing reconciliation with God. It's a pure gift, and that's what mercy most essentially is. It's a gratuitous gift of God's love. Something that we don't deserve, something that we can't earn, something isn't given, that isn't given to us because we've earned it. It's a gratuitous gift because of who God is and how much he loves his creatures. Now, sometimes, well, I want to say one other thing here. The good works that the Lord is leading us in, Pope Francis right now is saying, in this year of mercy, we need to recover our understanding and practice of the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. He says, let us rediscover these corporal works of mercy to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, welcome the stranger, heal the sick, visit the imprisoned and bury the dead. And quite honestly, I've periodically you know, helped with my wife at homeless shelters and things like that, and we give money to the poor and all that. But I, I got inspired to join the St. Vincent de Paul Society because of Pope Francis, you know? And so on, on Tuesday mornings when I'm in town, I, I, I spend a couple hours handing out Kroger gift cards and uh, clothing vouchers for our St. Vincent de Paul store and bus tokens and things like that. And it's just been really, really wonderful. And my wife is working in the store and we, 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 we try to respond to Pope Francis with, with this. And then he also says, let us not forget the spiritual works of mercy. Which, which ties more directly into evangelization, listen to these things. To counsel the doubtful, to instruct the ignorant, to admonish sinners, to comfort the afflicted, to forgive offenses, to bear patiently who do us ill, and pray for the living and the dead. You know, prayer and fasting is really important because of the spiritual battle that we're in, and it is a spiritual battle. Evangelization is about engaging the enemy and delivering people from deception, delivering people from bondage, delivering people from sin. It's spiritual warfare, and we have to consider paying the price that St. John Vianney paid. It wasn't easy in ours. It didn't fall into his lap. It was hard soil. It was new evangelization soil even then. These were baptized Catholics who were hard against the church. Who knows how much prayer and fasting St. John Vianney did for the first people to begin to open their hearts to being reconciled with God and coming back to church. I, I felt inspired to restore that in my own life uh, when I first came back to the Lord when I made a cursio when I was a senior at Notre Dame. I was very concerned that my sisters, I had four sisters who were away from the church, even though they all had gone to Catholic colleges. Um, and, and I just felt like I should start fasting one day a week for them. And, and in about a year, they all came back to the Lord and they're still with the Lord. And I think the Lord just wanted to encourage me. You know, there's other people now I'm praying and fasting for. It's taking it much longer. <laughs> But it feels so good to be praying and fasting and to be persevering in intercession for the salvation of souls. And I think that really has to be an underpinning uh, to our evangelization. Now, sometimes Pope Francis says things that aren't totally clear and maybe even a little confusing, you know? You know, we get the mercy message, but sometimes he says other things that, that seem to be not so clear. But with mercy, He's really clear, and most people don't know it, but he's absolutely consistent, and he repeats it dozens and dozens of times that mercy requires a response. It requires a response of faith and repentance. In his apostolic exhortation on evangelization, the joy of the gospel, in the very first paragraph, this is what he says. The joy of the gospel fills the hearts and lives of all who encounter Jesus. Those who accept his offer of salvation are set free from sin, sorrow, inner emptiness, and loneliness. I invite all Christians everywhere at this very moment to a renewed personal encounter with Jesus Christ. 
Now is the time to say to Jesus, Lord, I have let myself be deceived. In a thousand ways I have shunned your love. Yet here I am once more to renew my covenant with you. I need you. Save me once again, Lord. Take me once more into your redeeming embrace. How good it feels to come back to him whenever we are lost. Let me say this once more, Pope Francis. God never tires of forgiving us. We are the ones who tire of seeking his mercy. Dozens and dozens of other quotes, which I don't have time for. But let's especially now look at those passages in scripture that are most cited to demonstrate the mercy of Jesus. What, what's the most famous one that people use all the time? The, the Rembrandt image of the prodigal son or the merciful father? Luke chapter 15. What happened here? The prodigal son took the wrong path. He squandered his inheritance. He left his home. He stopped practicing his faith. And he lost his inheritance on loose living, consorting with prostitutes. And to use the modern 12-step language, he hit bottom. And the futility and the frustration and the emptiness and the failure fell into him, fell on him, and he came to his senses and he decided to return to his father's house. What does he say? He says, I will rise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And he arose and came to his father. He repented, he went to confession. He asked forgiveness. And the mercy of the Father, which was always there, always ready to be extended, longing to be extended, was able to flood into his life and the celebration began. But that couldn't happen until he repented. That couldn't happen until he returned. That couldn't happen until he changed his direction. It's really important to see that. Another tremendous example of Jesus' mercy is how he dealt with the woman caught in adultery. John chapter eight, you know the story. All those who wanted to condemn her disappeared. Jesus says, is there anybody here to condemn you? And the woman says, no one, Lord. But listen to what Jesus said. Neither do I condemn you, but go and do not sin again. And then remember the story of the guy who was very ill, and for 38 years he tried to be the first one down into the pool when the angel stirred the water so he could get healed and he never made it? Jesus had mercy on him and healed him. But then the scripture tells us that Jesus made a point of going after him and finding him and telling him this. John chapter five. See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse befall you. There is nowhere in the scripture where the mercy of God doesn't expect the response of faith and repentance. And one of the huge deceptions is that just because God is merciful, that means I'm okay. We become okay when we respond to mercy, when we repent, when we believe. And that needs to be part of the message. This is also very, very true about what Jesus told St. Faustina. Section 1396 of her diary. Oh, if sinners only knew of my mercy, they would not perish in such great numbers. Section 1160 of her diary. Jesus says, I am prolonging the time of mercy for the sake of sinners, but woe to them if they do not recognize this time of my visitation. That makes me think of the words of Jesus where he was weeping over the city of Jerusalem, weeping over his own people because 
they were missing the hour of their visitation and he knew what the consequences of that would be, the destruction of Jerusalem, the dispersion of the Jews to the four corners of the world, and it's intermingled in the gospel with accounts of the final judgment because it's a foretype of the final judgment. The consequence of rejecting the mercy of God, it's what's talked about in 2 Thessalonians chapter two. Section 965 of her diary. Jesus looked at me and said, souls perish in spite of my bitter passion. I'm giving them the last hope of salvation, the feast of my mercy. If they will not adore my mercy, they will perish for all eternity. Secretary of my mercy, write, tell souls about this great mercy of mine because the day of my judgment is near. And just one, one last quote, section 635 of her diary. Mary is now speaking to St. Faustina. You have to speak to the world about his great mercy and prepare the world for the second coming of him who will come not as a merciful savior but as a just judge. The time between the first and second comings of Jesus is the time where mercy is proclaimed to the world, where mercy is extended to the world. But when the full number of those enter in, that time will come to an end and the lamb who was slain for our sins is gonna return this time not as a lamb, but as returning in glory to judge the living and dead, returning in his true, true nature as king. Still the lamb, but the king. How awesome is that day already set as the day of justice, the day of divine wrath, the angels tremble before it, and here's a sentence for us. Speak to souls about this great mercy while it is still the time for granting mercy. If you keep silent now, you'll be answerable for a great number of souls on that terrible day. Our Catholic people need to know the whole message of mercy. They need to know the urgency of communicating the gospel. They need to know the urgency, the difference it will make in somebody's life if they believe and repent, and if they don't believe and don't repent because there really is a heaven and there really is a hell, and it really matters whether we respond or not to the light that God is giving us. It really matters if we respond to the cross of Jesus Christ. Something is really at stake. And so when the, the speaker this afternoon, Alan, mentioned that you have the most important job in the world, you do, but so does every baptized Catholic. Jesus is expecting us to share the treasure, not just because it makes people's life go better, it does, but because life is short. And only one thing is necessary, like the psalm says, it's like a puff of smoke that disappears. Life is so short. And only one thing is necessary, that people make a decision for or against Jesus Christ. That's it. That's, that's the purpose of life. We've been created for one purpose only, for union with God. And that's, that's what's gonna determine the success or failure of our life. Now, there, like I said before, there is just tremendous pressure not to tell people the truth, to narrow down those scripture passages that we're willing to talk about. Have you noticed that sometimes there's brackets over some of the scripture readings? Even when it's a really short reading, and sometimes there's good liturgical reasons for it, but sometimes even where a really short reading they'll kind of bracket the last sentence that talks about the consequences of not responding to mercy. There's a fear to tell people the whole truth. The very first time in 30 years that you'll ever mention the consequences and the possibility of hell, people will say, you're always talking about fire and brimstone. <laughs> you know why? Satan has put a bug in people's mind that he's protecting them from hearing the truth by telling them that that's a legitimate reaction because they've heard that. They've never heard it at all. There's an incredible silence about the eternal consequences that are at stake. Another way in which this is coming at us right now, and we're not gonna be able to avoid it, is in the area of sexual immorality. 
Listen to what St. Paul says. 1 Corinthians chapter six. Don't let anybody deceive you. Oh, the world is full of deception in this area. We're being brainwashed, we're being threatened, we're being compelled, we're being bullied. The immoral will not enter the kingdom of God. The fornicator, the adulterer, those who practice homosexuality, thieves, revilers, robbers, idolaters will not enter the kingdom of God. Could there be a clearer assertion than that? And remember what Vatican II says about how we're supposed to take the assertions of sacred scripture. They're teaching faithfully, firmly, and without error those truths which God's consigned to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. And this isn't an isolated text. It wouldn't matter if it was an isolated text, but it's not. Paul repeats this in Galatians chapter five. The works of the flesh are plain, immorality, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, selfishness, dissension, party spirit, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and the like. I warn you as I warned you before. He's repeating something again. He only does this several times. It's just like when Jesus says, solemnly, solemnly, I tell you. He's saying, kind of wake up, guys, this is really important. When Paul repeats something, he's saying, you really gotta get this clear. You know, simple and clear, simple and clear. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter five. Be sure of this. This is something you need to be sure of. Not, not foggy about, not waffling about. No immoral or impure man or one who is covetous, that is an idolater, will ever enter the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for it is because of these things that the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Our people need help. They need to know the truth. It's the truth that will save them. We need to speak the truth in love. If we don't, we're gonna be answerable for a lot of souls in that day because our people are being flooded with deception in this whole area. Now this is hard, this is hard. We're gonna have, probably in our own families, a son or daughter, a sister or brother, come home for Thanksgiving with their partner whom they're having sex with and they're not married and whatever. And they're gonna tell us, if you unconditionally love me, you'd accept what I'm doing. And we're gonna have to say, because I unconditionally love you, I can't agree that what you're doing is gonna lead to your happiness on this earth and you're endangering your eternal salvation and the door is always open and I always love you, but I can't support or encourage or approve behavior that scripture tells us will wreck our bodies and endanger our salvation. And we have to be prepared to hear, well, I'm never coming home for Thanksgiving again. We have to bear that pain. It's not unity at any cost, it isn't. Jesus says, remember when the baby Jesus was brought into the temple by Mary and Joseph and Simeon took the baby Jesus in his arm Remember what the prophecy said. This child will be the cause for the rise and the fall of many in Israel. He'll be a sign of contradiction. He'll reveal the secrets of hearts. That's what Jesus does. And he warned us, if we love mother or father or son or daughter more than him, we're not worthy of the kingdom. He warned us of even being able to bear and to face and to accept, if necessary, out of faithfulness to Jesus and his word, even division in a family. He prophesied it. He says there will be division in families over me. And he warned us to get our priorities and our loyalties straight. We don't, we don't say this in a proud way. We don't say this in a judging way. Like, like Paul said, Like Paul said, I can't find it, but I know it. 
Remember when he was leaving the Ephesian elders, we just read it in the liturgy, he says, for three years with tears, I've spoken to the whole counsel of God, so your blood is not on my hands. I've told you the truth for three years with tears. In another place, he says, with tears, I tell you that some have made themselves an enemy of the cross of Christ and have made their God their belly. I say it with tears. I say it with weeping, just like Jesus was weeping. This is the attitude of heart out of which we speak the truth in love for the salvation of souls. Now, believe it or not, I'm gonna end with this. Everything I've said tonight is in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It really is everything. This is how the Catechism summarizes it. Section 1864. There are no limits to the mercy of God, but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and a salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. I'll repeat it. There are no limits to the mercy of God, but anyone who deliberately refuses to accept his mercy by repenting rejects the forgiveness of his sins and the salvation offered by the Holy Spirit. Believe it or not, this is also in Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, section 14. It says us Catholics should recognize that the gift of being a Catholic is not because of our own merits, but because of the grace of God. But then it goes on to say that anybody who doesn't respond to this grace in thought, word, and deed, not only will they not be saved, but they will be the more severely judged. What the heck? How does the church get the right to say that? Well, you look at the footnote and you see about eight references to the sayings of Jesus. The grace of being a Catholic is a tremendous gift, but those who don't respond in thought, word, and deed to this gift, not only will they not be saved, this is an exact quote, I memorized it, because it's so memorable. Not only will they not be saved, but they'll be the more severely judged. And you know what? In St. John Paul's encyclical on evangelization, Mission of the Redeemer, at the end of the first section, he repeats that quote exactly. What a privilege to be called into the service of Jesus Christ. What an utterly unfathomable gift to be shown by the God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. What an amazing thing that through the gift of the Holy Spirit we could say with all our heart, with love and with trust, that Jesus Christ is Lord. And what a tremendous blessing that Jesus wants to involve us in something so significant as the eternal salvation of human beings and to join him in his mission to seek and to save those who are lost. So that's, despite all the practical stuff I do and have done, that's what I felt like I should speak to you about tonight. So praise the Lord.